Paul, by the Spirit of God, writes in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. I love that passage. I love the promise of that passage that there is a new start, that there is a new day, there is a new beginning for each and every person who trusts in Jesus. And that new start, that new beginning, doesn't just happen one time. It doesn't just happen the moment that you first believe, but it happens each and every day as you put to death the sin in our lives and as you rise to live with God in Jesus Christ. He makes everything new. He gives a new creation. He gives a new start, a new beginning to each and every soul who trusts in Him. Now, I think that there is a mantra that could be used by all people who know that God is making all things new. And it could be used whether you're a student in school who gets in trouble by your teacher, or you're a husband who gets in trouble by your wife, or you're a worker who gets in trouble by your boss. And that mantra can be, hey, God isn't finished with me yet. God isn't finished with me yet. God isn't finished with me yet. In other words, I am a work in progress. And that is the promise of God's Word, that He is making all things new, that each and every person is a work in progress. And just as you can say to me and I can say to you, God is not finished with you yet, so God also says that to His entire creation. I'm not finished with you yet. God hasn't given up on his world. Just as he hasn't given up on any soul, God hasn't given up on any part of his creation, and his promise is to make all things new. That really, my friends, is what Revelation chapter 21 that we'll look at in its entirety today is all about. God making all things new for those who come to Jesus and to whom Jesus comes on the day of all days when he returns in great power and glory, on the day where he had promised our grief will be turned to joy. We open up to Revelation 21, beginning with verse 1, where John teaches us this about the new thing, the new start, the new beginning that God is doing. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I'd like to comment on that for a moment. No longer any sea. God is making all things new. If you think about the sea as it's used metaphorically in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 13, it said that the beast and the dragon came forth from the sea. So the devil rose up from the sea. So what it's saying, there's no longer any sea in God's new creation, in God's heaven, is that there will be no place for the devil. Remember last chapter, Revelation 20, showed us that the devil himself was destroyed. It showed us that death itself had died. And so there is no longer any ability for the evil one to even come and tamper with and mess up this new creation. There is no chance that there will ever be a fall into sin again. That in the new creation of the heavens and the earth, the new reality that Jesus Christ will inaugurate on his coming day, there will be no chance for the devil to ever mess it up or mess you up. That is good news. Verse 2, John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then He said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. 
But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Eternal life. Eternal life that Jesus Christ, coming from heaven above, where he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, will bring to this earth eternal life that Jesus Christ delivers to all those who trust in him, who say of him, I am yours and you are mine. Jesus gives eternal life as an inheritance to those who believe in him, and as it says in Revelation 21, verse 7, to those who are victorious. So the victory is Jesus. The victory is Jesus over sin, over death, and over the power of the devil. But for those who are in Christ, that victory then becomes theirs. You share in the victory that Jesus has achieved over Satan's sin and death, over the unholy trinity, over, as you might remember, the puppy monkey baby of the ugly one, Satan himself, right? The deceiver the one who seeks to come and steal and kill and destroy your life. But Jesus has come, John 10, verse 10, that you might have life and have it to the full. So when you are united with Christ through trusting in Him, you are in Christ. Colossians chapter 3 says, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Earlier in our worship service today, we sang a song that talks about that truth of the Scripture, about our lives hidden with Christ. It says in Before the Throne of God Above, Behold Him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect, spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I Am, the King of glory and of grace, one with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. You see that? You are in Jesus Christ, and therefore you share in His victory. The image that He gives here is of you being like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And that image, as you note, is not only speaking about how God looks at you, but also how all people will be able to see Christ's church on the day when He comes again when those who have gone before us who are already arrayed in the righteousness of Christ, who are already in His presence and glory, come with Him and we are united together around the throne of God for eternity, we will see each other as God sees us now. Sometimes, even looking at other Christians, we see each other for our flaws and our faults. We say, well, that person did this to me, therefore I'm going to do that to them. Or that person ignored me, I'm going to ignore them. That person wronged me, I'm going to wrong them. And we see each other according to the old order of things. But if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And the new is like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. The husband being Jesus the bride being you. Now, I have to tell you, many times in doing weddings, I'll give a little pep talk right beforehand to the groom. All right? You know that these grooms are nervous. They've had so much work cut out for them. Be there on time, 10 minutes early, wear a tux. That's all you got to do. But they're so nervous, right? So I get with the, the groom beforehand, and I say, okay, here's a few things you got to remember. Don't lock your knees. Take deep breaths. Don't ever offend your father-in-law. And I say, remember the moment when the bride walks down the aisle. And I always love that moment when the bride walks down the aisle and I look at the young pup groom and I think, what's he thinking right now? Maybe I don't want to know, but what is he thinking right now? And I say, don't forget that moment. You see the bride beautifully dressed and coming your way. Remember that moment when you wake up for many years to come and you've had a rough night's sleep and so has she. Remember that moment. Remember that moment when she's smiling and there's a twinkle in your eye, when she's yelling and screaming at you because you forgot to fold the laundry. Remember that moment. She's a bride, beautifully dressed. She is your bride, beautifully dressed. Remember how gorgeous she is. Even in those moments where you feel like I'm done, remember the beauty that comes when the bride and the groom together become one. 
you know, that is a moment, that is a reality that God says is what happens when you and I come to faith in Jesus Christ. And the beautiful consummation of that marriage comes when Christ comes again in glory and we stand completely clothed in His righteousness and we see one another as He has seen us all along, as holy and blameless because we are in Jesus Christ. That is the life that God wants for those who cling to Him by faith. But John also points out that the Lord has spoken words that remind us of eternal condemnation for those who have rejected the bridegroom. Those who have said to him, I don't want any part with you. I don't want your rescuing work. I don't want your forgiveness. I want to live life on my own terms. And it says in verse 8 that they will experience not only a first death that all people experience, a physical death, but also a second death that is eternal condemnation, separation from Almighty God. And notice what they are said to be the unbelieving, and then it describes them, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars. So what's going on here is that those who have rejected Jesus Christ still have their sins hanging over them. They haven't handed their sins to Jesus, the sin bearer, the Lamb of God, who has rescued them and died for their sins. So therefore, where are their sins? They're still on them. Have you ever seen someone play basketball? Maybe you've done it yourself. And someone makes a mistake, but someone else has to uh, pay the penalty for it somehow. Some guy uh, didn't guard his man well, and the guy came up and dunked over somebody else. And the guy says, my bad, my bad, my bad. It's on me, it's on me, right? And so Jesus Christ, when you cling to him by faith, says all that stuff, all that sin, all that old order of things, it's on me, it's on me, it's on me. But those who have rejected Christ on the last day, he says, hey, it's it's now on you. And it grieves his heart to be able to see someone who has rejected him time and time again. But as I've said before, as C.S. Lewis points out in one of his works, he says, there are only two types of people in this world. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those who in the end, God says to them, thy will be done. Those who accept the will of God, there's Jesus Christ and his salvation, and those who reject the will of God, and God finally on the last day says, it's now on you. We don't want that for anyone. We don't want the second death for anyone. And so we say of Jesus Christ, he died so that you may live. Come to him, believe in him, trust in him, and have the gift of life that he intends for all who would simply believe. John continues to see this picture, and there is no more room for death. There is only life, and there is light. Verse 9, he says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues. You remember those chapters? They were ugly chapters in Revelation. One of them came to me and said to me, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high, And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and with twelve angels on the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements and it was 144 cubits thick, a cubit being roughly the length from the bottom of your elbow to the top of your hand. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a gate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, 
the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. If you could just imagine for a moment what that would feel like for the Apostle John to get this vision. There's a picture here on the screen that's of, of John, what it may have felt like for him to look at this, this vision of glory, the city of God, this dwelling place where God comes to live forever among his people. And John is looking at this. I, I, I wonder what John's vision was like. We know that he received this revelation when he was exiled on the island of Patmos, but was it in a dream while he was sleeping? Were his eyes open and he was seeing this in the clouds? We don't know exactly, but we can only imagine, based upon what he has written down, how beautiful, beautiful this vision was. The dimensions of the city filled with the numbers that refer to the twelve tribes of old, the twelve apostles of the New Testament era, the holy city with its walls and its dimensions. It's almost like a a cube that's designed out of the Minecraft game that many people are infatuated with today. And in its four-square perfection, this cubed city, this walled city, this glorious city is the place of God's forever dwelling right among his people. Do you notice that all of the words of the different jewels that are used to describe this city and the measurements that are used to describe this city? It's hard to translate, I think, from the Hebrew into the English, and most English translations will even say, hey, this is our best guess as to what these Hebrew words mean. But here's what we know. It is fantastic, this city of God. And as John is looking into this fantastic city of God, Remembering that four speaks of creation, therefore this cubed four-fold, four-square perfect city is perfect creation, new creation, a new beginning. John thinks, now that is where I get to live. That is where I get to be. That is where God comes from heaven above and dwells with me and me with him. That is my home. I've been but a stranger here. That heaven is my home. Imagine what it feels like on the day where you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. And will it matter on that day the dimensions of the city? Will it matter on the day what kind of jewels really were there marking the sidewalks or the roads? Will it matter that day of all the great things that we have done or all the things that we had failed to do? What will matter on that day when we come to the gates of that city and we are greeted by the Lord Jesus Christ. What will matter is the one who is the pearl. What will matter is the one who is the crown jewel of all. And as you notice in Revelation 21, verse 21, it says the twelve gates were twelve pearls, but then notice this, each gate made of a single pearl. If you think back to all of the things we've talked about in Revelation so far, we've talked about the seven bowls and the seven plagues. We've talked about the winged creatures and the 24 elders. We've talked about the different churches that were given instructions on how they were to live their lives. We talked about the dragon, the beast of the sea, the beast of the earth. We talked about the woman who was adorned. We talked about all of these different things. And there are so many biblical prophecies that are out there and predictions that are out there and books that are out there and seminars that are out there and YouTube videos that are out there going into these great depths to explain away every single thing in every single chapter of this 22 book, 22 chapter book. And really what it all comes down to is One pearl, one jewel, one person, one name, one author and giver of life whose name is above all names, that at the name, singular, of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the one person, the one name, the one thing, the one Savior, the one Lamb, the one lamp who will matter on that day. Nothing else but saying of Jesus Christ, 
I am his and he is mine. As a branch is to the vine, I am Christ's and he is mine. That is the one pearl that matters. That is the one Savior who makes you new. I love how John wraps up this little chapter focusing upon this one Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 22, I didn't see a temple in the city. No more building, no more sanctuary, no more place to go to church, so to speak. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city didn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it. Why? For the glory of God gives its light. And the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut. There's no harm that can come upon you, no enemy that can attack you, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter into it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Because God cannot tolerate sin in His presence. God, who has provided a remedy for our sin in Jesus Christ, takes all of that sin that was conquered, that was put to death at the cross, and all of that sin that was overcome by Jesus' resurrection, and He gives us new life so that He can welcome us into His presence forever. The Lamb of God is its lamp. You need no sun or moon, for the giver of the sun and the moon now shines with His brilliant glory upon you. Do you see that? Do you feel that? Can you experience that? How awesome that will be. And here's the best part. The reservations have been made for you there. There's a place for you there. And that by the redeeming blood that Jesus Christ shed upon the cross, He took out His pen and He wrote your name in the book of life. And so that when you stand at the threshold of that city of gold, that new Jerusalem, you can say, I'm not a stranger here because there's a place for me. This is my home. This is the place where I am made new. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here.